they're supposed to go. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, can you hear me? Because I actually, yeah, we need more. Hello, hello. Is that any better? Any better? Yeah. Well, the guys said the mic should be here. Okay. Can okay. Is that any better or? Okay. That's not supposed to happen. Hello. That works. Yes. Is the okay. Anyways, uh, welcome to the WikiLeaks uh, talk. Um, uh, we're very glad to see that so many people have come uh, for this keynote. Um, I'd like to maybe uh, pick up where Cohen left off in the first talk, um, thanking everyone who has built up this great place for the next couple of days. We all hope you enjoy yourselves. Um, my name is Daniel. I'm with WikiLeaks in Germany. Um, this is Julian, whom you might know from writing for WikiLeaks as well. Uh, he also published a couple of books, um, one of them quite popular in uh, this scene. Um, we, uh, Julian will give you an introduction to WikiLeaks, um, and after that, we'll be talking about some current developments. So, enjoy your talk, and Julian will take over now. Okay, can everyone hear me uh, down the back? Yeah? Okay. Now, what about my accent? Okay. Um, Humanity has had a long history of tyranny. Wherever there are riches to be had or land to be grabbed, there are tyrants and tyrannical institutions. Humanity has had an equally long history of rebelling against these same tyrannies and exposing their injustices. I have seen the degradation of politics and war firsthand. But I still believe in the ability of people to rebel against tyranny and injustice. Without this belief, I wouldn't be standing here before you today at Ha 2009. From the Spartacus slave uprisings of Rome to the serf rebellions under Tsarist Russia to the activists of the 1968 Prague Spring, people have stood together en masse against tyranny. Individuals often act as catalysts for this rejection of tyranny. 19th century American writer Henry David Thoreau popularized the term civil disobedience when he opposed an unjust war. He was a 19th century geek. He obsessed in his work alone. He built a house in forests much like these, to be alone. He was an outsider, and it was this perspective that let him say what others could not. There are other catalysts for civil disobedience, many famous, such as Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King. Some of these catalysts, such as Nelson Mandela, won their wars. Others, such as the brave Aung San Suu Kyi, continue to serve as successful points of opposition in battles that have yet to be won. What is unique in our moment of history is the convergence of the very old notion of civil disobedience and a newly globalized world in which less than 200 milliseconds separates everyone from New York to Nairobi. And that fact has led to a new phenomenon global digital disobedience, where people of the world can come together to support each other in their mutual struggles. Digital disobedience uses technology to catalyze positive social change. It uses technology to call corrupt institutions and individuals to account, no matter in what country they're in. It enhances the power of nonviolent protest, and it is not just a theory. We have shown it works. What is special about this gathering here in the Netherlands, held once every four years, is that it is a showcase for the evolving nature of digital disobedience. From its earliest days, this event has shown how technology can be a tool for reform. At HIP in 1997, this community learned how the German government tried to shut down a small nuclear protest magazine because it didn't like what the magazine said. Geeks and activists 
including many of the original founders of this gathering, joined together to ensure freedom of speech by hosting the magazine, including at the great Dutch ISP Access for All. The German government effectively blocked Access for All behind the scenes. It was Access for All but the people of Germany. If the German government's move was heavy-handed and clunky, this community's response was light and agile. Geek set up mirroring on a scale that had rarely been done before, and the German authorities backed down. That was an important early point on the timeline of digital disobedience. WikiLeaks is another such point. Started in 2007, WikiLeaks is the world's first uncensored, secure, and anonymous whistleblowing site. Civil disobedience can have a high human cost. After the Spartacus uprisings 2,000 years ago, Rome crucified more than 4,000 slaves. Their bodies still line the famous Appian Way, which was Rome's first superhighway. At WikiLeaks, we use technology to try and reduce the human cost of civil disobedience and promote justice. We don't want bodies to line our new global highway. And now I will give you some examples of information that we have helped to put into the public sphere that otherwise would not. And later, my colleague Daniel will give you a list of information that should be in the public sphere but still is not. Okay, so my first example, actually I'll, I'll list, Daniel, can you, no, it's okay. You can just push the space, yeah. Okay, so it's important to say what WikiLeaks is and what it is not. So it is a platform, but it is part of a larger project, which is by Sunshine Press. And this is our particular realization of the concept of getting out documents that, achieve, that generate political reform to a world stage. So it uses technology, but it is not a specific technology. We use lawyers, but we are not just a legal organization like the ACLU. And we also use political strategies, but we are also not a political party. Although sometimes I think people may have been <laughs> So, who of you here is familiar with Guantanamo Bay? I hope it's all from the outside. Um, we received the main manuals for Guantanamo Bay. And that's the standard operating procedure. And uh, we received that in late 2007. At the time, you may remember that the political line being pushed by the United States was that Guantanamo Bay was, in fact, a model prison. But through our work and, of course, other people's, we showed that this was not true. So we received the 2003 manual to Guantanamo Bay. The ACLU had been trying for five years at that stage to get the manual under the Freedom of Information Act uh, and had been denied all that time. The 2003 manual revealed that Prisoners were being uh, held secretly uh, from the Red Cross, which is a violation of international law. That they uh, underwent numerous psychological abuses and uh, also some physical abuses in great detail. That release uh, to the public then, of course, generated a lot of media interest and press coverage and responses by um, the commanders uh, of Guantanamo Bay. In their response, and in the US Defense Department's response, uh, it was stated that that was then, that a new commander had taken over and the prison had been reformed. That lie invigorated another whistleblower to step forward and give us the next year's manual, 2004. And by comparing these two, we were able to show that, in fact, the situation for prisoners in Guantanamo 
had degraded over time, that it hadn't gotten worse. And then a new camp had been set up, Camp 4, which was a media show camp. So it hadn't gotten better, rather the perception had changed because of propaganda. Now this is something we've often seen, that one leak uh, will inspire other people. Daniel Ellsberg, the famous American whistleblower who leaked the Pentagon Papers, and whose most recent article is on the front page of WikiLeaks, has often said that uh, courage is contagious, that one courageous act well done inspires other people to follow suit. And so we often see this, great streams of leaks from a particular country or a particular institution following others. guys in the back all wide, right? Okay, can you hear me now? What about now? Can anyone not, not hear me? Please put your hand up. <laughs> oh. Okay, so it's not just the American military, although it's certainly an, 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 well actually this is about the American military as well, so all right. Um, although there's certainly a large amount of stuff, but it's not just about America or Cuba. Right here, earlier this year, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, this is the front page of NRC Hansel Blad. Is my pronunciation correct? No. Hansel Blad. <laughs> a great Dutch newspaper, I hear. Um, so I get we upstage uh, what looks to be like Hillary Clinton's visit to the Netherlands. So we obtained from a source an encrypted PDF from the RAND Corporation. Now some of you may remember that the, the RAND Corporation uh, is a, a US Defense Department think tank. And in fact it's where Daniel Ellsberg worked um, before he leaked the Pentagon Papers from the RAND Corporation. This was an intelligent assessment, 200 pages, uh, of what had been happening in Iraq and, and Afghanistan. It interviewed over 100 uh, intelligence agents uh, in NATO. And a, number, and a number of the most candid of those uh, worked for the Dutch military. So they exposed that Dutch soldiers had been corrupted by, morally corrupted by their experience in Afghanistan, which of course should come as no surprise because war always corrupts its participants. It also exposed the relationship between uh, the Netherlands and the United States was not that of equals in NATO. The Netherlands Air Force had been instructed to go on bombing runs in Afghanistan. And after it had dropped its bombs, it wanted to know had it hit its targets, were there, civil, were there civilian casualties? And of course, as far as I know, the Dutch government doesn't have its own spy satellites circling Afghanistan. So it asked for uh, the satellite images from the United States of the regions that it had bombed on behalf of the United States to see if there were civilian casualties. And the United States said, no, that's classified information. You can buy our planes and drop bombs for us in Afghanistan, but in fact, you can't have access to the satellite photos that show where your bombs drop. Um, so I just mentioned, I can't go into detail for this case, but we don't just do documents, so here, here's one uh, from Peru. Uh, these little countries can give great examples of what happens when uh, speak. whistleblowing really gets going uh, in a country. So this is 86 telephone intercepts of Peruvian politicians. And this man on the left, has a, a journalist, had some real problems with his stuff. So he worked together to get this out uh, simultaneously on WikiLeaks and then you could write about it in the Peruvian papers. So this is the front page of every paper in Peru to dramatically change the political climate at least for a few months uh, in Peru. And we've had a number of other uh, audio leaks as well. 
Um, this is about a famous uh, case, um, the Bank Julius Baer case, uh, which is ongoing, still information being revealed this, uh, from The Guardian. Okay, so I personally, uh, having lived in Kenya uh, over, on and off over the past uh, few years, have seen uh, some fairly dramatic impacts. I have, I have also seen a number of assassinations and exposed assassinations uh, together with our sources on WikiLeaks. And this is an example which is uh, a great bit of information, but I can't go into too much detail. So this is from East Timor, which was recently liberated. That's our newest democracy, actually. Recently liberated from the Indonesian regime. And there's a, a famous rebel commander there who was assassinated. And we were given this telephone uh, SMS intelligence map. So what you can see are all these people involved in the lead up to the assassination, who called whom um, and what the order was. And you guys should know that uh, the NSA has these as well. So every telephone call that transitions to the United States can generate one of these. In this case, it's something that's, that was uh, quite good and, and helped work out uh, who was involved in that assassination. Uh, you will have to speak up. Okay. Wow. Well. <laughs> the, the power of the thing. Um, okay. So, in Kenya last, uh, in December 2007, uh, I was present, and we were involved in getting hold of a, a report uh, that revealed that the president, uh, Daniel Arap Moy had uh, stolen uh, $4 billion uh, from the Kenyan treasury over time. And this is a country where the average person makes $1 a day. So $4 billion is a, a real dent in the, in the economy. The, Hello. The, the context of that report is interesting because it shows you that uh, regular civil society and civil government institutions are not enough once people get into power. So President Kibaki uh, got, the president of Kenya at that time in 2007, got into power on an anti-corruption ticket that he would clean out all the corruption that had happened under Moy and uh, his cronies. He commissioned an, a private intelligence firm in the UK called Kroll Associates to track down where the money went. Uh, he, that firm produced a report and gave it to the Kabaki government. The Kabaki government then sat on the report and instead used it for political leverage. And just before the Kenyan election, Kabaki went into coalition with Moy, headed up to the election, and everyone thought this means these guys are definitely going to win, the two major power groupings. And three days later, we released uh, that intelligence report. And it was front page of The Guardian for 20 nights running on Kenyan TV. Uh, that issue, there was nothing else but that issue. And the result uh, was a 10% swing in the vote. We know that from another intelligence report from the Kenyan intelligence. And Kibaki lost the election. As a result of losing the election, there were major constitutional uh, reforms in Kenya. Another thing that uh, we've received information from in Kenya is uh, a whole lot of extrajudicial assassinations. So if you think about what the United States has been doing with its special forces, uh, Dick Cheney's assassination squad, um, going out and assassinating people suspected of being members of Al-Qaeda. Well, Kenya uh, took note of that and in fact assassinated over a thousand people that it didn't like with government approval uh, outside the court system. And uh, I, some other Kenyan journalists and the human rights investigators uh, at, the human rights, at the Kenyan Human Rights Commission um, 
released an investigation, or tr sorry, tried to release an investigation, were not able to politically. We then released the investigation uh, to the world, and as a result of that, the UN intervened, a special reporter was assigned, um, and there's been ongoing investigations. Two of the sources, the public sources uh, to that report, uh, two friends of mine, and this shows you something very important, that uh, when you're public uh, and you're in the wrong country, a bad things can happen. So these two people, two uh, human rights lawyers who were um, the founder of the Oscar Foundation and his colleague, uh, were assassinated. Uh, in, were, assassinated in were assassinated in broad daylight uh, on their way to a meeting at uh, the Kenyan Human Rights Commission. So the we've had a lot of um, we get we get sued about once per month, and we get illegal letters about once every two weeks. We get sued about once per month and get legal letters about once every two weeks, and it's interesting to see where these sources come from. They're uh, from banking institutions, they're from the military, and sometimes media and government. But really, the banking institutions have an unusual uh, uh, attitude uh, towards us. So there's a famous case last year uh, that we dealt with. This is uh, Bank Julius Baer. And um, it's a Swiss bank. Uh, we revealed uh, the money laundering operations uh, and asset hiding operations in the Cayman Islands. And they went after us uh, in California. And some of you may remember this case. Uh, we briefly lost our .org. Uh, registration uh, for approximately one week. We built a legal coalition uh, that was able to uh, defeat that. And um, so this has continued with uh, similar investment bank cases uh, in uh, South Africa in just last week in the, the United Arab Emirates. And uh, something you may have seen recently, which is um, Corp thing. So an Icelandic, uh, the largest uh, bank in Iceland, uh, two weeks ago we leaked its loan book, all loans over 45 million euro. And uh, the result of uh, leaking this loan book was of course an immediate attack by uh, the Corp Think Bank uh, on us, which we easily resisted. But it then took the most unusual step of injuncting all the media in Iceland from reporting that we had released the loan book. And inside the loan book, it reveals that the principals of Corp Thing and billionaires in the UK uh, had been, in fact, loaning themselves billions and billions of dollars without collateral. And they had been loaning people who had shares in Corp Thing money based upon the shares in Corp Thing. So, a bit of a pyramid scheme to pump up the share price and um, to do favours for friends uh, uh, in Corp Thing. As a result, there was public outrage uh, by the censoring of, in relation to the censoring of the national broadcaster uh, in, in Iceland. And it's interesting to see these island cases because everyone in the community, everyone in the community can come together and uh, when it's an island, you can see what is causing uh, the effect. Uh, so there, this was, this has been in all the major newspapers around the world uh, over the past week. The Icelandic president has come out and said that they're going to change uh, banking uh, secrecy laws uh, in Iceland to make it easier for people to reveal uh, the behavior of these investment banks. And even the UK uh, Serious Fraud Office has called uh, for more people to come forward, more corp thing whistleblowers uh, to come forward and reveal banking documents. So there's actually a, a world of information as far as these banks are concerned. So people say that the other two banks in Iceland, uh, Glitnir is one and the other is absolutely unpronounceable, um, uh, have uh, actually, John Cleese has a segment on how to pronounce corp thing. That's also unpronounceable. Um, uh, these are even worse cases. Um, 
We've seen other cases in Turks and Caicos Islands and uh, East Timor I mentioned before. And I believe that these island cases show that if we can increase the amount of whistleblowing that, and document leaking that's happening in major countries, we will see the same effect as we do in these uh, island uh, countries and smaller communities, which are totally transformed by the revelation of information, serious information. And once again, this has inspired other people. So we've now received a whole lot more information about Corp thing, including um, SMS messages going back several months between uh, the CEO of Corp thing and a former government minister uh, in Iceland, which will release soon, um, revealing that they had fabricated documents uh, inside Corp thing. Okay, so um, now that's an example of some of the material that we have uh, successfully released and it has gone on to successfully uh, produce reform. There's many, many other examples, um, in fact uh, thousands of other examples that we have done and that I have also been involved in. Um, so some of you may be familiar with our, uh, our, our censorship work and the many uh, censorship lists that we've released from China, from Badu, which is China's um, equivalent of Google, um, from the Thailand, from Norway, uh, from Australia, a, a very famous case, from Denmark. Um, but we don't have time to go into that now, but uh, on Friday at, at 11 p.m., uh, we'll be doing a session just, uh, just on some of these censorship cases and um, and we'll speak a little bit more about that later on. Um, well, that's not yours. Okay. It's my section, I guess. Okay. Shall so, I take over? Or okay. So that is an example of when it goes well, the amount of impact that can be had just by revealing information which is suppressed. The value of the... Why go after the suppressed information, the constricted information? Well, it's because... In the universe of information, it's hard to know what matters. What is actually going to produce some reform? You need a way of measuring the value, some signal, some economic signal. And the economic signal that is given to us is how hard do people try to suppress it? Because what we have seen is that they have an understanding of their own information, their internal information. And the more the degree of effort to which they go to to suppress that information represents a signal about the potential reform effect of that information. So that is how we are able to pick the pieces of information, the pieces of knowledge that are hidden in the world which will have the greatest reform effect uh, for civilization. And now we will present some stuff that we don't have and that journalists that I've spoken to want and human rights lawyers and internet activists have nominated. Um, we first decided to do this when uh, a year ago a Dutch IT consultant uh, came to me and said, well, it's great what you're doing and it's amazing that you've had such incredible political impact, but I am a technical person. I don't understand what it is that's going to make this impact, what the zeitgeist is in the media at that moment. How can I contribute the right thing to this? I have a lot of access as an IT consultant. I'm an insider in many organizations. But how do I know uh, what to give you? Do you have a list? And we didn't have a list. But I thought it was actually a really good idea that we did have a list. So now we, now we have a list, not perfect, but pretty good. And Daniel is going to tell you about this list. Okay. So, um, as Julian said before... Um, as Julian said before, um, 
We thought it is important to understand. I mean, we're getting a lot of information about the problems that exist in our world, and we started it would be good to get a sample of what are the documents that all these organizations out there want to defend freedom of speech, to defend human rights, and all these interests that we have for the common good of the world. So we put out a call um, asking for the most wanted documents of these organizations in the world. So what we can see from the list we have compiled is, for one, we have found out what areas we can reach in the world. So we now know from all these countries or from the people that have given us feedback what countries reach our messages if we're offering our helps. Um, we also have a sort of a sample, a cross-section of real-world problems, tangible problems. So each problem or each document described is very specific. Um, we also have a lot of examples of unsuccessful sourcing. So these are all documents that um, within the last years or even decades, organizations have been trying to source. Um, journalists have tried to source. Um, in the example of Guantanamo, um, these manuals that we published, um, the ACLU had been trying to get these manuals for many, many years. And uh, when we published um, the Guantanamo manuals a few weeks later, um, the ACLU actually, after years, received their copy under the Freedom of Information Act, and it was redacted. So they did not even get the full copy, and it was only a reaction to the fact that we had published the full thing that they did get anything at all. So it's a lot of organizations out there, people out there fighting for a good, th good cause that know that there is a certain specific document that they need, but they don't know how to get their hands on it. And this is what we're trying to assist. So in many cases, after years of desperate searches. Um, also, these are guidelines, as Julian uh, said, these are guidelines for anyone who wants to know what information actually would be useful. So anyone that has access to information for whatever re reason, that is an insider working in a corporation or a government, can look at this list and maybe will find a document that he or she can source and maybe out of a moral calling um, submit to WikiLeaks. Um, the list is, uh, this is um, a screenshot on the left-hand side from, uh, from the index of the list. So in total, we have uh, 33 countries in the list that have contributed their documents. I know it's not really readable very well, but if you go to the wiki, you can see that. Um, the top country with most submissions was the United States. Um, I assume it is because uh, we have a lot of readers in the United States and we're very popular. and. What, as with anything else that we do in the project, um, the more people know about what we're doing, the more people actually also would involve and deliver this information or put themselves on that list. So um, but just have that mentioned. Uh, the term censorship was mentioned in 11 descriptions. So we can see that this is one of the stronger topics. Uh, 11 documents are also finance related. So there's a lot of people that are interested in specific financial details of transactions or um, whatever dealings within corp corporations or governments. Um, 12 of them are contract related. So they are in many cases related to contracts um, for the United States military, for example, or um, also related to a lot of countries where um, foreign countries drill for oil, for example, or other countries where there's um, situations where water is being privatized in South America and people um, want to know what specific contracts have been made between them and the government. Um, these are a few examples. So we have um, examples from open government and tra uh, corporate transparency issues. Um, one of the files that was requested for Germany is our current chancellor's uh, Stasi files, which I guess everybody would uh, really like to see. In Bahrain, there are some demogra um, demography issues, for example. So um, there are no known numbers of how many foreign people are, in, are let into the country. So um, the Bahrainian citizens are in, interested in this. Um, we have uh, requests about human rights abuse and torture. So especially for Guatemala, we have a lot of examples where um, the CIA has been very active in the, in the 80s and people would like to see certain documents on plans that um, the Americans have pursued in Guatemala. Um, we have development and environmental issues. So there's oil exploitation contracts in Madagascar. 
We have uh, the Isuzu challenge in Mexico, which according to some sources um, is um, a cover up for, uh, for something like eco piracy, where people drive into some eco um, protected area and um, start pirating the nature. Um, from Rwanda, we have, uh, there are documents on government payments made to um, a military person where people would like to know what this was about. Um, others are about citizen and media freedoms. So we have internet surveillance in Colombia. We have a lot of um, Stasi background from Germany, as well as uh, various um, citizen freedom files. Uh, then there's Puerto Rico with FBI surveillance. So it's a mixed bag of all sorts of areas that we can cover with this list. And then, as Julian pointed out, there is the big issue of censorship that we have right now. So um, documents have been requested for China, the UK, Germany, Australia, and Italy. So as one follow-up, because we don't have the time to talk about this list in specific and to talk about the censorship issue, we will have um, a podium discussion about censorship, which is going to happen on Saturday. So on Saturday, when everything's over, uh, no, so, sorry, it's on Friday. Um, this is still the wrong slide. It's on Friday, so tomorrow at 11 o'clock, um, uh, 11 p.m., so after the last talk in track two in the tent over there, we'll be having a podium discussion. Um, we're still collecting a few people that we think are uh, important to represent um, experts or specialists in that field, and we would like to openly discuss with anyone in the audience what we can do to counter this problem that we're all facing in Germany or throughout Europe, throughout the world. Um, it's not specifically restricted to internet censorship, but I think this is what it boils down to for most information media. We believe that we all need one strong voice globally against censorship, and we also believe that each one of you has a responsibility to become part of this global voice. So whoever feels that his freedom of speech and freedom of expression are an important topic should please join us for this talk in the other track. Um, tonight at 2300, uh, so the same time as tomorrow, we will here have a follow-up on the most wanted leaks. So anyone out there who really feels that um, he has talent, that uh, he is smart, and that he can take up a challenge, we would like to offer uh, you some perspective of how you can successfully help, tangibly help uh, bettering our world, involving in our project, and maybe help spreading some of the truth that we all are seeking for. So whoever is free tonight, not too drunk by 11 o'clock, um, is welcome to come around. And I hope that we can then maybe talk about some of the most wanted leaks, how to successfully source documents, where actually these documents can be found, who can be approached, what kind of people can help with these things. So, and this is going to happen here. So tomorrow, 11 o'clock, uh, today, 11 o'clock here, and tomorrow in the other track. So realize your potential. Join us at uh, 2300. And um, I guess now um, we're also running short of time. We'd like to offer you some uh, possibilities for questions as well. We'd like to thank, in the end, um, all of our courageous sources that have contributed to making WikiLeaks a success in the last years, um, all the investigative journalists that care about the stories and the material that cooperated with us, um, all the organizations supporting freedom of speech, open media, and truth and justice all over the world. Uh, I see some four people sitting here. They are a perfect example of ones that uh, are riding in the front of this crowd. Um, and all those that will maybe take a decision today to join us at 2300 um, to use their potential for making the world a little bit better. In that respect, uh, finally, thanks for your attention. Uh, have a great hire. Uh, we also have t-shirts for this year and some other merchandise. Before I forget that, um, we have a village in the E area. Um, we have around 250 t-shirts. Whoever would want one is perfectly welcome to drop by and we can sell them off. And I guess, um, sorry? I don't understand you. <laughs> yes, uh, and donations for sure are also welcome, but I guess that uh, goes by for itself. So whoever would want to talk to us about that topic is also welcome to join us for a debate. So 
Thanks a lot in that respect. Um, we get the 10 minute sign. We now have a couple of minutes for questions. Um, so thanks a lot. And if there are any questions, please let us know. OK, anyone? Uh, uh, there is one question questions? over there. OK. How do you verify your sources? Uh, well, we don't, I guess we don't verify sources. We verify documents. That's what I would, uh, that's what I would say. Sources are anonymous, so it's pretty hard to verify the source if you don't know the source in the first place. Well, then how do you verify the documents? So, do you want to? Yeah, so this is actually pretty easy if you're not lazy. Um, a document purports to be written by some organization or some person. So one of the easiest ways is you just call them up and ask. <laughs> Not so hard. And the answer is yes, no, or I won't tell you. And if it's no, you have to do a bit more work. I don't think it's ever been no, actually. No, oh, I don't think it's so. It's never been no. Because they don't know where you got it from. So there might be someone else in the organization who will just come out straight after that no and say yes. And that looks really, really bad. Yes is often done with a little bit of spin control. So big organizations know that the way to get positive stories is to talk to journalists. Because if you don't talk to journalists, the journalist goes, that bastard wouldn't even talk to me. Right. So the media liaison units know that, and they do like to talk. Others, uh, as an example, we released a classified document on Fallujah, uh, several actually, one on the prison, and that reformed all of the prisons in Western Iraq. Uh, another on the attack in Fallujah. UPI, a uh, friend of mine at UPI, Sean Waters, who's a national security uh, correspondent, he then approached the US military, his contact, and said, what about this document? And he's like, I'm sorry, Sean, I can't help you with anything about that. I can't talk about that. But it's not a no. And then you just go through the facts of the document. Hey, well, you can't tell me that this document exists. But did this happen? And did this happen? And did this happen? And did this happen? OK, so what you're saying is that everything in the document happened, but you're not telling me whether the document is true. <laughs> and then from that point, you just use your, your experience and your journalistic guff and say, and say well, it's true. It's, it's just obvious it's true. The, the, amount of conspiracy or economic costs that would be necessary to not have that would be necessary to not have that uh, would be fanciful. Question. Do you uh, try to anonymize documents to get rid of digital watermarking techniques that might serialize the documents? Yeah, so uh, good question. Um, yes, we do. So it, it depends a little bit on the type of document we get. So everything uh, unless it's just something that's been censored. So we know that, you know, it's a public document, it was censored, there's no issue as to the source. Um, we reformat the document. Now, depend, depending on uh, the potential threat to the source and the, how likely it is someone's going to investigate. It's top secret document's a big deal to look at something from a bank compared to something from a university. Uh, we will then either completely re format the document by dumping, say, from Word to PDF to PostScript and then back. Um, or we will partially do this, just to strip out the metadata and any possible encoded metadata. The, the reason that you don't want to go all the way all the time is because if someone is consciously trying to detect if a source is leaking, it's very easy. So they can just put some spaces in the document or change one or two words. Um, so there's no point in trying to prevent uh, manual conscious attempts at trying to discover which source is leaking. But people making mistakes is a very big one. Um, and then uh, any sort of automatic uh, watermarking or, or time stamping uh, is something uh, also to deal with. Well, in uh, Holland, we can uh, do uh, WOP for Zoek. 
requesting uh, public information from a government related uh, Yes. Um, well, we have uh, in Holland, the government has to give information about uh, public-related uh, um, uh, uh, subjects, like um, the pollution of our air or the pollution of our drinking waters. And um, well, when we send a letter to the government to the Vrom Inspectie, uh, the Vrom Inspectie. In, in the Netherlands, when, when the details get very hairy, they, they say, well, the document you're requesting no longer falls under the, the law of um, sending public information, and the, the document is now in the hands of a, a small company which we are hiring. So then the information is blocking, and in and, and, and that way you can't go continue in, in your research. How, how are you going to solve that problem? How am I going to solve this problem? <laughs> it's on. So can I ask, is, is there anyone who understood that question? Can someone repeat it? Probe, probe. This is working. necessarily, but rather because the corporation they've outsourced to has the document and is no longer beholden to the law because the law is, is somehow separate from this corporation. Yeah, a good question and, and a big problem, especially in the UK, where there are uh, over 1,000 quangos. This is quasi-governmental organizations. So, so we have released, in fact, a number of leaks from these quangos that are set up outside government, but are funded by government, perform the work of government but don't have the accountability of government, they don't have freedom of information acts, etc. Um, those quangos are a big issue in the UK at the moment. I'm not sure whether there will be a reform of them because it's very easy to make a government, to make an organisation take less government funding, pull it away uh, to the point where you can say it really is a separate entity. So there's a blurry line there. And yeah, the only way to get it out you know, is by leaking. Also the Freedom of Information Act, which, which is, I think, possibly the best tool for democratic governments that has been invented uh, when it's followed is not followed and it's delayed extensively. So you can have victories. Uh, just a few months ago there was a, a Guardian article as a result of a freedom of information request uh, that we put in uh, on the UK Defence Department. So as part of our proactive attempts to see if there are investigations of sources in Defence Departments and elsewhere, we FOI them to, to try and find any internal investigation that may have happened or may be happening. In the case of the UK uh, Ministry of Defence, we had found that they had noticed particular uh, classified UK documents on WikiLeaks and had started up an internal investigation, hadn't been able to find the source, and then decided that the solution was to tell British Telecom to block all connections coming out of the Department of Defence uh, to our main Swedish IPs. Um, but we still get plenty of UK uh, Ministry of Defence documents, so apparently not too effective. Have, have you ever found two identical or seemingly identical documents that were leaked to you that had some sort of word differences that were perhaps steganographic encodings of the person that had the document so that, that maybe they'd gone to something more active in terms of watermarking instead of just like MS Word document watermarking or something? Like where the text had yeah. been changed and you'd notice the difference we between two of the same documents? documents. One word had been modified. One word different. Yeah. Something. No, we haven't. But by the way, if, if you are a source and you suspect that someone's doing this white space trick or changing one or two words, uh, your best defense is to get another document from a colleague and com compare, do a hash, see if they're different. And if they are different, use your colleagues. <laughs> Um, but actually, we, we have received multiple versions of documents, and that can be very interesting, like in that Guantanamo case, or a draft, a draft document versus the public representation, or something that uh, was classified and then declassified, and you see what stuff is removed. Um, in the case, the case of uh, uh, 
uh, uh, it's complicated, but an, an American military device that was used in Iraq. We had two uh, descriptions of tests on this device uh, that were very, very slightly different, and it revealed that they had concealed things about faults in this device. So comparisons are great, and by the way, side-by-side uh, -side diff is really great. Um, we did this for, for Guantanamo, and that revealed in very fine detail uh, all the little changes, in including some quite pathological changes. So, for, for example, um, changing, removing all the words attempted suicide and replacing that with self-harm. So a big difference in the response because the doctors on board have to do certain things when there's an attempted suicide they don't have to do self-harm. Time's out. Time's out? Yes. Okay, uh, so yes, time's out. Um, what's the next presentation? Um, actually, good question. I haven't had a look at the schedule at all yet. Ah, there's Mr. Nielsen, if I remember your name correctly, at least. I don't know. Okay, okay thanks for, uh, thanks for your coming attention. And